This is a relay project. Real talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. I want to welcome you to this edition of the Real Talk Roundtable. In just a second, we're going to check in with our friends at Alberta Municipalities. President Tyler Gannon joining us, the mayor of Wetasco and the mayor of Okotoks, Tanya Thorne, is going to join us as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about provincial police services. We're going to be talking about uh, municipal political parties. Looking forward to getting into the nitty gritty on this as, as we ask the question, simple but not, what's best for Alberta uh, to our Albertan audience members or those of you interested in the politics around one of Canada's most dynamic provinces no risk in putting that out there this episode's for you and in just a second we're going to welcome those two to the show we also wanted to recognize that today the day that we're doing this March 22nd is World Water Day and if you didn't have a chance to check out our roundtable yesterday with three water experts we want to let you know it's available for you right now on YouTube wherever you get your podcasts Water Wars is the name of the episode as we get into uh, some of the threats to our water security in Canada, some of the implications on industry, obviously the convergence of our environment and our economies, a really great conversation. We We talk about lack of fresh water. I mean, you talk about water security. There's not water security for many First Nations communities in Canada, let alone people living in underdeveloped or poverty stricken areas around the world. A good conversation. Conversation, an important conversation, especially just weeks ahead of what we believe is going to be a very significant drought and wildfire season. Uh, yesterday's episode, our March 21st episode, prompted a quick email from Janice to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We sure appreciate this. She says, uh, I just wanted to check in and say how impressed I was with your three guests on the Water Wars episode. Janice says they were passionate, well-spoken, and extremely knowledgeable about water issues and other climate threats. It gives me a sense of hope that there are people who will be representing us to assist in our water and climate fight. That from Janice. I appreciate that. And Johnny, I like the spirit of her email because all three of our panelists yesterday, uh, despite the fact that we were talking about dire circumstances and basically threats to human existence on planet Earth, yeah they found reasons for optimism they did and it started out with and if i can be candid we're fucked yeah and then it ended up but we don't have to be we don't have to be yeah so i thought that was really good so so take time whether it's today on world water day or at some point over the next few days uh to check out that episode we're talking alberta politics in this episode and, and that's coming up in 30 seconds but first a quick shout out To those of you that right now are eager for a new opportunity, you're looking for a change of pace, you're either unemployed or underemployed, and you know given an opportunity, you're ready to thrive, you're ready to shine. Have you checked out Rello? The better real estate training starts at Rello.ca. That's R-E-L-O.ca. It's Alberta's top real estate school. And what sets them apart from the others, they're going to support you every single step of the way. They've got online instructors that are available through the week. They're going to help you study for your real estate exam. They're going to help you get your license and then... Well, the relationship doesn't end there. You can plus, of course, study 100% online on your own schedule, which I know a lot of people love. That's what Real Talkers tell us when they email in to let us know about their Rello graduations. Congratulations to all of you. The coolest part about right now, the team at Rello is making available a promo code exclusive to Real Talkers. It's all one word, Real Talk, which is going to knock 20% off any Rello course. That's a great deal. 20% off any Rello course with the code Real Talk at Rello.ca. We're going to talk policing. We're going to talk politics. We're going to talk infrastructure dollars. We're, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff in this episode of Real Talk. And to tee it up, we want to look, as a matter of fact, at the most recent episode of The Discourse, the political podcast hosted by Erica Brudis and Cheryl Oates. If you're not familiar with their project, they come at Western Canadian political issues through two different lenses. Cheryl, a longtime senior staffer for NDP Premier Rachel Notley, 
uh, Erica, of course, the founding president of the United Conservative Party. And they're taking on what they describe as Alberta's police farce. The plan for the Daniel Smith Conservatives to introduce, let's say, an alternative to the RCMP. The first voice you're going to hear is Daniel Smith's Minister of Public Safety, Mike Ellis, and then starts the discourse. The role of the Sheriff's Branch has changed incrementally over the years as the public safety needs and uh, expectations of the community in Alberta have changed. These amendments will ensure that these police-like functions will be aligned with the legislation governing policing and are carried out by independent agency that falls squarely under that legislation. Nobody worry, we're not creating a new police force, but we are creating a police-like force that may offer the police services in communities that are currently using the RCMP, but it's not a new police service. Do we need to make an organization? I don't know, but I'm I'm trusting that the government knows. But I'm damn proud that something's being done about this. I'm so sick of talking about public safety and not being tough on crime. I'm really sick of it. But why can't we just give sheriffs, a body that already exists, why can't we just give them the power to do the police-like functions that they can't currently do? You can disagree with the semantics or the organizations or operations or administrations or whatever. But you know what? If this has rewards and solves that problem that we've all been talking about for, gosh, like over over two years in rural Alberta, this is this was in our platform in 2019. Let's just pretend the shoe was on the other foot and a different government with different political stripes was solving a problem by one, creating more bureaucracy and two, throwing money at it, as you would say. I don't think the UCP would support this so- plan. You can catch the discourse on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast, new episodes every Thursday as we welcome to the show the president of Alberta municipalities, the mayor of Wetasco and Tyler Gandam, uh, the director for Towns South, the mayor of Okotoks, Tanya Thorne. Good morning to both of you and thanks for joining us. Gandam, uh, for the benefit of those on the podcast, that mustache, you, that mo you are rocking right now is next level. I'm just seeing it right now for the first time. What's the story? Just thought I'd try something new. And because Mayor Thorne loves it so much, it's uh, it's that much better. <laughs> you looked, you, he, that, there may be a bit of a facetious nature to that comment, Mayor Thorne. I think just a small little bit. In fact, I sent him a text just a little while ago telling him how much I really liked it. Yeah. Well, are, are you using actual like mustache wax with that thing? Are you doing that old school? When, when I have to go out and look really, really good, absolutely, there's a little bit of mustache wax in there. Okay, well, I'm, I mean, I'm envisioning you as one of Alberta's new appointed deputies here. I mean, if, if I've ever seen a mustache that would work in a cop cruiser, that's the one. Uh, let's get serious, though. This this plan, uh, it was dubbed by, I think we'll give Cheryl Oates the credit on it, the, the Alberta police farce. She's obviously not sold on the idea. Uh, Tyler, how are you feeling? Like, for, for, first of all, as a citizen of Alberta, how's the idea landing with you? I think the fact that we're we're struggling in getting police response, uh, I, every little bit is going to help. I had the opportunity to talk to Minister Ellis last week, uh, get a little bit more clarification on it, and giving sheriffs police-like uh, authority or power uh, is going to help out in some in some way for sure. I mean, that's one piece of the puzzle that we definitely need to be working on in terms of uh, crime in Alberta, our justice system, the recidivism, the uh, the constant prolific offenders and the, the catch and release program uh, is something else that needs to be addressed. So I'm I'm optimistic that sheriffs, given the, the police like power, uh, not creating a new police force is, is something in the right direction for sure as a start. OK, uh, Mayor Thorne in Okotoks, uh, police by RCMP, correct? Correct. OK, so so what's what's been the what's your assessment of the the service in Okotoks right now? I have no concerns about it. We we need bodies. Um, you know, I think that is a core challenge with policing across the country is new officers um, and bodies to fill vacancies and retirements and all of those things. So, you know, we've got a vacancy issue, but in terms of the service that's being delivered, I have no issues. Do you like are you uh, do you share uh, Mayor Ganim's perspective on what the province is talking about right now? Do you have some immediate concerns? What's your mind telling you? Yeah, like I I agree that anything we're doing to invest in public safety has um, the potential to be a win. Um, I'm just not sure about creating a duplicate organization um, and infrastructure uh, for a new agency, whether that makes sense, Um, you know, with the sheriffs right now. Um, they have the ability to become police officers. There's independent police forces, the RCMP, that that are hiring all across this province. Um, and they're not making the move to become 
police like or police. So, you know, and I, I think my other concern is, are the sheriffs looking at this? Like, do they want to do this? I, I haven't had confirmation, but I'd heard the union state that they were never consulted with this move. So how do the sheriffs actually feel about this move? And are they going to want this? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, my understanding is that uh, the union uh, representing the sheriffs uh, have basically said it was not consulted. Uh, Tyler, you're the president of Alberta municipalities. Were you guys consulted by the province on this? Nope. Okay. That seems to be a missed opportunity. <laughs> that seems to be a theme. <laughs> I don't know. I would think, can, can you remind our audience members how many communities Alberta municipalities represents and like the, 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 you know, the, the coverage across the province, so to speak of, of what that voice would represent. Yeah. So we represent just over 260 municipalities across the province and a number of those are under the provincial policing service agreement. So the PPSA who have been crying for more support, more police officers and more representation in their communities. So absolutely a missed opportunity to have some dialogue with Alberta municipalities on what this would look like. Yeah, Sylvia in our live chat on YouTube says a new organization is not going to improve a staffing pro, uh, problem. Uh, Brian Sauvé is president of the National Police Federation. Um, I'm citing a comment that he made to CBC News. Uh, he says they are, quote, deeply concerned and perplexed about uh, Bill 11, which is what we're talking about. Uh, that's the Public Safety Statutes Amendment Act for the geeks and nerds out there. Uh, that's a compliment, not an insult. Um, it says Alberta has significant policing infrastructure in place through the Alberta RCMP, yet the government has not increased funding for our members to keep pace with population growth and evolving crime in the province. says proposed changes to policing in Alberta have been deeply unpopular with Alberta residents, and this announcement appears to be yet another attempt to force an unwanted and expensive policing change on taxpayers. Uh, when it comes down to it, this is kind of a two-headed monster for a talk show uh, because, number one, you're talking about public safety, which is obviously a huge deal. I know both of you will want to talk about that. And number two, you're talking about big cost, uh, which is downloaded to taxpayers, downloaded to municipalities. So it's kind of we, – we need to have the conversation on two fronts, Yeah. I Absolutely. Think so. Sorry, oh. go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, that's the thing with this new legislation is who is paying for it? What's the cost to create, create a new agency? There's costs to that. There's supports to that. And then for, um, you know, we're already paying for PPSA. What is the new cost for sheriffs? Because there's going to be an increased cost to that. If they're going to move them to police-like functions, I would expect there's an increased cost for one training, but just salaries and what they would demand for a salary cost. I don't know what that difference is. So there's no details on that. And, and I think the end of the day is how are the sheriffs going to interact with those communities? How are they going to liaise with the RCMP? Um, what does that look like? Right now, they do a lot of you know, traffic enforcement, which is important. But are we now having them respond to calls? Like, I, there's just so many gaps in what's being proposed. Um, and uh, I always struggle with finding things out at the tail end of it, because you should be trying to build things with a plan of what the outcome is. And I'm not sure we know what the outcome is here. Yeah. Uh, Tracy in our chat says this is a good example of something that can be put to a referendum uh, with municipalities through their elections. Yeah, it, it, this is kind of an interesting trend in politics, and it seems like politicians, some of them anyway, are promising more and more of these type public consultations, uh, referendums, so to speak. I'd be curious to know, like, you know, when it comes to what the general public says, I know we've seen polling because we've talked about it on the show, uh, but you have to wonder, like, is the average citizen, and this is the mandate of shows like this that we're doing, Tyler, but does the average citizen truly understand the implications of sticking with what we've got now versus making the change? And, and, and this is not to fault the average citizen, but I don't know that the average Albertan would have a clear understanding of what would actually change. You know, some people in our chat right now are saying this is going to be like 90% of the same officer just going to work in a different uniform. I mean, that could very well be the case, right? We don't know. Exactly. And Tanya said that too. It's it's a matter of, of resourcing and having enough people to, to fill those uniforms or those cars. I think the average citizen, what their concern is, is if I call 911 and I need police there, are they coming? And I think that's first and foremost. And it doesn't matter what car they arrive in, what their uniform is, they need to be arriving on scene to be able to address the problem that they have. And that's something that we've struggled with, especially in the rural areas right now, 
where response times are 45 minutes or an hour away, uh, it makes it really difficult to police those smaller communities or the rural Alberta. And if giving sheriffs a police-like authority changes that, then data and statistics are going to be able to, to prove that. They're going to be able to say that, you know, 50% of their calls now are being responded to within 20 minutes as opposed to 45 or whatever the case is. But there'll be statistics to be able to fall back on and say this is working or it's not working. But what we can say for sure is right now what we're doing is not working, especially for rural Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can build on that just for a second, Ryan, um, you know, we talk about response times, but um, there is also depending how far you are from a from a detachment, um, your response put time may never change from 45 minutes unless we're going to start looking at putting more detachments in place, um, hubbing lots of different options there. So I don't know whether response times is completely the best metric um, because there is going to be areas in the province where um, response times are going to be different. I get a five minute response or under five minute response time in my community because my municipal t detachment is 15 minutes from everybody um, in our community. So we can respond quickly, whereas, you know, your rural Alberta, they could be 45 minutes an hour from the closest detachment we're not going to improve a response time unless we change and put more detachments, which requires more bodies in place. Uh, we've got an audience member here, Tracy, that says uh, she's concerned about decreased accountability, decreased quality of service, which are, you know, sort of seem to be things that I think would be top of mind for anybody. Um, the oversight, the, the administration of the program, I mean, who's going to, who's going to sort of oversee this whole thing is, is, is a, a pretty obvious area of focus that we'd have to talk about as well, Tyler. I mean, th there's sort of a, a lot of murkiness around this right now. Again, speaking with Minister Ellis, it was not to be overseen by the government. It would be um, a, a police body or a police commission that would be overseeing the, the sheriffs in that aspect. So, again, whether or not it works or it doesn't work, uh, if we're not willing to try something new, we're, we're going to continue to still have the same problems that we had before. So I'm, I'm always game for trying something new with the understanding that if it's not working out or we need to change what we're doing to improve it again, that we're open to that. Yeah, uh, something new for the sake of something new isn't always a great solution, though, right? I can think of applications in my own personal life for just because something's not working great. If you don't have a smart plan to replace it with a different perspective that's costed out properly uh, and well explained to the public, then you, you might be on the road to ruin there. Um, it, it, can, can we dig back into what both of your week looked? Was it, wasn't this last week where like more than 300 of you, uh, mayors, chief administrative officers met in Alberta? just capital city to talk about a whole bunch of stuff like drought wildfire everything else can, can, can you take us into the spring municipal leaders caucus and and kind of what the mandate was tyler yeah absolutely last week we had a little over 350 people <clears throat> excuse me join us in edmonton um to talk about those very things uh, let me give you a second to grab a glass of water tanya what was when you're <laughs> hey man this is the live show this is what happens sometimes yeah. what, what was your number one focus heading i mean obviously you know you're, you're the mayor of okadokes you're, you're going there representing your constituents but also you have a, a key leadership role as a director with alberta municipalities so how did you head into those meetings what was top of mind yeah. for you well i think that we had some really good topics you know we talked about um drought and water management what that's going to look like um uh that was a big discussion wildfire season then, you know, hearing from uh, talking about discourse in politics, all of those things. And what I our, our spring caucus is uh, a smaller group. Right. And we get into just a few different topics. And I think that gives really good focus. And because it's a smaller group, we have better interaction sometimes with the province. Um, you know, so they had their ministers out. The premier was out. Um, so it's interesting to hear their perspectives um, and then the work we do as municipalities talking about what each of us is doing. Um, that gives us a good opportunity to talk about all of those things. Is it, uh, Tyler, how would you how would you describe the vibe of the meetings? Because uh, let, let me just say us us citizens here, uh, yeah. the general public are getting the sense right now that the, the relationships um, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but but especially post budget. Uh, the message I'm picking up from municipalities loud and clear is that there is a bit of a breakdown in this relationship between 
between Alberta municipalities and the provincial government. Is that is that accurate? And if so, how did that impact the vibe of the caucus meetings? Yeah, I think the vibe was really good. I had the opportunity to address the group uh, first thing Thursday morning and just just laid it out there that, you know, I understand you're having a tough time and it doesn't just need to be with your relationship with the province. Um, the, the disappointment with the budget right now, public discourse is is at a pretty all time low. Uh, the abuse that elected officials are taking is unacceptable. And I think everybody across the province is feeling that. So recognizing that you're not alone in this and there's a bunch of other really good elected officials who are um, feeling the same thing. Feels good to have that support and maybe misery loves company, but we uh, we had a really good opportunity to come together and do some networking, talk about the things that Tanya was talking about in terms of wildfires and uh, drought. We had a couple of ministers dialogue sessions or bear pit sessions where we had the opportunity to ask ministers questions on how we're going to improve our province. What is the plan on education, healthcare, infrastructure? all of those things. And I think it's really important that we get the opportunity to come together, to have those discussions, and at the same time, come together and, and know that you're supported by other people, by other peers. So the vibe was good. Uh, it just took a little bit to, to get re, reacquainted with everybody and have the opportunity to um, share with what's going on. This is, I mean, this. I think that's a message that the public wants to hear, though, right? That these meetings are happening, that the conversations are happening, that people are gathering in person, face to face. Tanya, like you, 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 that, that, that's a big deal in politics. Oftentimes, I don't think people can understand that doors can close, conversations can stop, and the public is then not being served. This, this is a good development, I think, isn't it? Um, yeah, like I think from a municipal discourse piece, um, we as municipalities, we do a lot of networking and a lot of conversations. Um, you know, we've all got our own uh, resources in the municipal world. Um, you know, yes, the province is there. Yes, there's a conversation, but I'm not sure I'd call it a dialogue. Um, I think that's a, you know, we ask questions, they give us a response, but there's not necessarily a um, back and forth dialogue around that. So I still think there's work to be done of actually sitting down with Alberta municipalities. I, you know, we represent those and having more wholesome discussions on some of these really key issues um, and trying to find a path forward. Um, most of the problems that I think we're seeing in our province and across the country, it requires more than one level of government to create a solution. I think we need to be working together far more than we do to find new solutions and innovative because things that we've been doing aren't working. So to recreate or to invent, uh, innovate, it requires us all to be willing to put solutions at the, at the table. And I think the great advantage of municipal leaders is we're used to shoestring budgets, quite honestly, and we can get pretty innovative. And so we have found a lot of different ways to maximize dollars that come into our community through all of the different organizations that serve our communities and create solutions to really complex and complicated problems. And I think if the problem or the province would be willing to sit down and have more dialogue with us, we could do some really cool things in this province. Yeah. Well, can you give me an example of somewhere you'd like to specifically see more focused dialogue progress? Well, I think funding, I think there needs to be an understanding on funding. But um, I think when we talk about all of these files, you know, there's a theme across all of them, whether it's housing, whether it's policing, there's a theme around all of them. And, and that is in that social services sector, in mental health support, social supports, um, all of those elements of how do we maximize what is there to its full potential? And where do we exactly need to invest? So I, I pick on this on policing all the time of do we need more police officers on the ground or we, do we need police officers that just get to do policing, which is what they're supposed to do instead of policing that has, they're dealing with social discourse, mental health, um, emergency room visits, all of those elements that isn't what originally what policing was designed to do. Yeah. We're, uh, we're asking a lot of our officers, um, I mean, t today, I, I mean, if people are listening to this, the day we're talking about this, this is the one year anniversary of the of the murder of two Edmonton police constables that were um, responding to a, a domestic incident. Obviously, everybody knows now what happened there. Those two young men, dads, brothers, husbands uh, shot and killed in the line of duty. And, 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 it, and it's prompted, I think, 
uh, that tragedy did and other ones across Canada and around the world, people to recognize uh, some of the situations that not just law enforcement officers are stepping into, but also bigger picture, how we're managing uh, situations involving domestic violence, mental health challenges, uh, addiction issues in the province. And it's becoming more and more of an issue. There's more people moving here. There's more strains on social services. There's, there's more strains on communities as well. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, Tanya? Because it's, it's a good news story, Alberta's growth, uh, Alberta's population growth, uh, the, the belief, the optimism that people have in this province and its industry and its economic future. At the same time, it's creating real strains on communities that as much as I love your optimism and you're not wrong talking about how you guys can get innovative and find ways to make things work and, and you, you keep working magic and trying to keep your property tax increases below like 10 percent, 10 percent like the new 4 percent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, there's things, there's real challenges that you can't ignore, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think that comes back to that infrastructure piece. You know, we're seeing a growing province. We already know there's a $30 billion deficit in infrastructure. Um, and so they're coming, you know, new people are coming. They don't stop wanting clean drinking water, wastewater, recreation centers, roads that aren't filled with potholes those things don't go away um, with new people coming and the people that are here want what they've got still being able to be accessible. Um, you know, I use my community, I'll use it as an example. We need a, you know, a new pool, which we've been saving for knowing that it's coming. So a recreation facility um, upgrade, but it's a, it's a $55 million touch for my community. Well, that that you can't save that on property tax in a short time frame, right? So I, you need support from other levels of government to make sure that that infrastructure is here. You can't have an Alberta calling campaign if none of us have recreation centers. So where is the the kid pro quo? And we're growing, but we're seeing the per capita expense for investment in infrastructure decreasing significantly. Like I think it was at 420. Tyler, you might have to correct me. 420 per person and we're now down at 127 per per, per person yeah it's I, I got some numbers here in, in front of me if like and I think that the, 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 this is what matters to people right like this is how people understand people are going to understand you know, let, let's be honest like our job here on this round table is to cut through all the like Charlie Brown teacher <laughs> when he's talking about political funding boring that's not the point but when you start talking to people about like you all of a sudden had to ha have to head to a tire shop now because you blew out your front tire on a pothole that wasn't repaired uh, for the last 18 months. Or you would love to take your kids skating or to the swimming pool, but your community hasn't had an investment in its rec center. Or your kids are busing to a school 40 minutes away because there's no school close to your community. Or a million other examples. That's when you're talking people's language, right? That's when people understand what it means to them. So here are some of these numbers. I think people might be surprised to know that local governments in Alberta uh, like in Wetaskiwin and Okotoks and other communities manage over $100 billion worth of infrastructure systems. Um, the provincial government's spending on infrastructure has dropped from 3.7% of total spending on the budget, so just under 4% uh, 10 years ago, to 1% today. That's a dramatic drop. Uh, provincial funding for local infrastructure, like you just said, Mayor Thorne, uh, has dropped from about $420 per Albertan in 2011, we'll call that 13 years ago, to about 150 bucks per Albertan uh, last year. That's a decrease of about $270 per Albertan every year. That's more than a billion dollars less investment in community infrastructure every year. Those are numbers people can wrap their minds around. 3.7% to 1%, that's no joke, Tyler. Absolutely. And that's not including other downloads that we've had too. So when the province owns property in your community, they had a program that is called Grants in Place of Taxes, so GPOT, and that's been cut in half. So when the municipality isn't getting money from the province for that, when we've gone from not paying for the RCMP biological casework to paying for it now, there's another bit that's coming out of your taxes again. So when your property taxes go up, uh, it's it's really difficult to maintain the level of service or be able to, to grow your community. Like some of the faster growing communities like Okotoks and Airdrie and Beaumont, Leduc, they're struggling to, to keep up with this growth while continuing to get cuts from the government from their infrastructure. It's 
what do you do? You either cut your, your levels of service, you uh, put off some of the projects that are needed, or you raise property taxes. And in most cases, you're doing all three. Yeah. But then municipalities are the one getting the blame that your taxes are going up. It's fantastic for the province. I was just going to say, if you're a provincial politician, that's the beauty of it. I know you don't want to hear it, yeah. but that's 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 the beauty of it for them. Yeah, you can balance a budget. You can keep your income tax low. All of those things are fantastic, but it's coming at an expense somewhere else, and it's within the municipality. Yeah. And that's one of the struggles that we have and why we've been advocating so hard for that $1.75 billion just as base funding for infrastructure, and that's just one piece of it. And we hear back like, well, okay, fine. We'll give you that billion dollars. Well, where do you want us to cut it from? What else do you want us to lose to make sure that you have that that money for infrastructure? And it can't be a one or the other. There's got to be some communication, some some way to work through how a, a municipality is supposed to grow or keep up with the infrastructure that they've got. As Tanya said, we've got a $30 billion infrastructure deficit across the province. And that's not including the growth that we're seeing right now. We want to be over 5 million people in the province of Alberta in the next few years. That's going to come at an expense. And whose expense is that going to be? And that's the conversations that we need to have. We need to have that plan moving forward on what education looks like, uh, health care, infrastructure, justice and policing. All of those things have to be a part of that plan moving forward. And that just really hasn't been the conversation that we've had um, through Alberta municipalities or through mayors and councillors across the province. Okay, so let me put you two on the spot. Uh, Tyler asked the question. Tanya, over to you. He goes, well, where, where do you want to take that billion dollars from? Where should the billion dollars come from? Where would you, if, you were, if you were the Minister of Finance, where should the billion dollars come from? I, I actually think we need to relook at the whole tax system, quite honestly. Um, and I know nobody wants to hear the, the tax piece, but I think we need to really look at what is the investment that we want to see in the community. So I'm not, I disagree with that it needs to rob from another place. I think we need to look at what are the outcomes we're achieving and what is, what is it that we see as a vision for our province going forward? Um, you know, and, and, and figure that out. I don't have a, detailed understanding of the provincial budget um i have i'm i'm a municipal elected mine is to understand my budget and i know how ours works and i think that that you know if i was to call a thing out as a municipal councillor all of our budgets are debated in public um fully to detail um whereas everything with the provincial budget is done behind closed doors and um you know it's 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 unveiled to us so I, th I think as a whole, Albertans don't know what's all entailed and in going into the budget. And I'm not saying they, they don't do all the work to do that, but it, it really gives a lack of understanding of what is actually in the budget and what are the outcomes we're achieving. From yeah. everything that we spend. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think that you know one of the big things that a budget accomplishes, generally speaking, we do our best to like our mandate is always like as the talk show, figure out what's most important, figure out what's most significant, and make sure it's not boring. And so yeah. when we when we talk to experts on things like budget analysis, that's the number one thing we're trying to do is like, what does this mean for you? What does this mean for families? And budgets, obviously, I think go a long way in communicating government's priorities. Uh, one of the things we could look at is this government's commitment to really significantly growing the heritage savings trust fund and you know you could talk now about the value of like you, you know or, or the, let me say the the approach of investing in savings uh at the expense of your infrastructure right like like you know and, and some might say well it's not really fair to just cherry pick this and cherry pick that and then draw a line between the two but but you, you could argue that that's exactly what alberta is doing right now right I mean, you know, you have a big, healthy Heritage Savings Trust Fund, but your, your roads are crumbling and your communities aren't growing in a dynamic fashion. You could ask, you know, generally speaking, where's the wisdom in that? Uh, we can put that out to our audience. Uh, talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you can let us know what you think or what you're making of this conversation and others. Uh, good comment here from Roy in the live chat who says the RCMP is responsible. Uh, back to policing. Uh, RCMP is responsible for national security uh, all the way through to like speeding tickets in rural communities, uh, making it hard for the, it to focus as an agency. Roy says Alberta's sheriffs can better align with Alberta's specific needs. Uh, I don't know. I'll take Roy's point. Interesting. Uh, meantime, James jumps in and says, what's up with the 
handlebar mustache. Uh, James, <laughs> w- James, we hit the most important stuff right off the top of the show. So you'll have to go to the first three minutes with Tyler Gannon to understand what's going on with that epic mo. Uh, more from these two in just a second. Uh, these are the people that are making it happen. Uh, president and, and director, uh, two mayors with Alberta municipalities. I want to talk about provincial pardon me, municipal political parties in just a second. Uh, Dr. Dwayne Brad, I think, threw a few people for a loop on the show earlier this week. Oh, he always does. He, he didn't, he didn't, <laughs> he, he didn't, he didn't come at it as an indictment. No. Uh, he came at it kind of open-minded, didn't he, when we talked to him? Yeah, when he started talking, I'm like, wait, I thought he was going to be 100% yeah. against this. I thought this. he was going to say it was an absolutely terrible idea. And I feel like when it was initially brought up before the campaign, it was kind of a scare tactic from the other side. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. But now I see... A lot of people kind of being like, well, if if there's pluses to this, if yeah. it improves things, I would be for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. People. Yeah. So 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 you can let us know what you think about this. That's what we want to put in front of these two uh, mayors, Gannam and Thorne in just a minute. Municipal political parties. It would be. I mean, don't fool yourself. It. This is a big deal. It would it would in, in just a wear jerseys major way. <laughs> would be wearing jerseys. Orange and blue. But in like a major, <laughs> it would dramatically yeah. change uh, municipal election campaigns. It would dramatically change how councils function. Of course. I think this is a really big story and it's a big national story. But do you uh, but really it's happening think, out of Alberta. But do you really think the average person doesn't know, you know, which way Mayor So he leans, or which way Gondek well, leans? Well, th- those really ones think- are easy. Those ones are easy because you know Mayor So he was a federal liberal minister. I'm so just, it's I'm easy. just speaking about the city's closest. You, you look at some of the. There's some controversy in Edmonton. I don't know if it's actual controversy. I, I think the story's a bit of a joke. Uh, I noticed it popped up in our live chat a couple of times this week. Edmonton Councillor Sarah Hamilton, yeah. uh, perceived by many to be a conservative councillor. Sure, uh, she's not officially aligned with the United no. Conservative Party, <laughs> but she's friendly with conservative politicians and and. In Edmonton on Edmonton's council let's get real here if if you're not like an absolute lefty sure uh, like if you're not like hard left you're kind of looked at as a conservative but right? it's, it's kind of like because I'm not a hard right talk show host in Alberta I'm looked at as a communist <laughs> but Councillor Hamilton has it has faced criticism this week from some people that for her attendance at an International Women's Day event that sure. was a UCP fundraiser and people are pissed off that that she was there but people know where you know Councillor Hamilton and Tim Cartmel align as opposed to where like you know michael jans and other counselors are right sure. like, people kind of generally know where they are on the spectrum and i'm the same way but as someone who doesn't know where every person in every seat leans wouldn't this create some sort of blind spot where you're just going to vote for the person you align with you're just going to vote for the color you align with where instead of looking at the actual issues that that person may be speaking about I th- that's what i'm afraid of i think you've hit the nail on the head and i think and i think a lot of people want to believe that their counselors aren't. I mean, this is this is the difference, and, and we'll get back to our mayors in just a, a second because they're the experts on this. Um, people want to believe that uh, politicians at a municipal level are not going to look at your garbage collection or whether or not you should be paying user fees at your rec center based on a political party's ideology. They want to believe on what's best. They, they, they want to make their decision based on what's best for the community, what's best for you, what's best for the future health of the community, right? More on that in just a quick second. First, if you don't have plans uh, on Saturday night, March 23rd, I want to put this amazing, immersive art event on your radar. Art is... Sneakerhead edition. So cool. You can get the details in the show notes on the podcast on YouTube or check out momentsbymorel.com. That's M O R R E L. Momentsbymorel.com. Step into a world where art transcends boundaries and embraces the extraordinary. If you're a sneakerhead, you know exactly what we're talking about. This amazing subculture is going to be on display and celebrated at the Harvest Building on 109th Street in Edmonton starting at 6 30 on Saturday. You'll have access to the Immersive art is experience, live demonstrations, art installations. They've got some brilliant artists attending. Uh, The opportunity to enter the minds of those artists one-on-one, pick their brains, talk to them while they're working, plus culinated, or or rather (laughs) curated culinary tastings. I'm inventing words here in this. West Edmonton location, that's Friesen Brothers. Glenora is going to officially open its doors. I had a chance to tour the facility uh, with the company's president, Doug Loveson, the other day. He is beaming 
he should be so very proud of what they've brought uh, to West Edmonton. The grocery game is changing. Their butcher shop will knock your socks off. And then, of course, there's their whole thing. I mean, this is like a church of sourdough, my friends. The cinnamon buns off the charts. The sourdough sandwich station. They've got a freaking wine bar. In the meantime, if you're still looking for a way to figure out your Easter dinner, you, you want to entertain family and friends, but you don't want to do all the work, they've got you covered as well at cateringbyfreezen.com. If you're looking to get organized, get decluttered in 2024, you know the solution. It's right there in front of you. It's California Closets. And the best part about working with them, right out of the gates, the consultation's free. You've got nothing to lose. You sit down with their design experts. You talk to them about your goals. You talk to them about the areas of your home that you'd really like to invest in. And then their minds go to work. Their creative process will blow your mind. And they're installers. I mean, nobody holds a candle to the California Closets installers. This is a game-changing opportunity for you to elevate your custom closets and your storage solutions at californiaclosets.ca. And before we get back to talking about communities, heck, we're talking a lot about infrastructure. You want to know who's doing a ton of work when it comes to the different communities, the industry that's driving those communities, and maximizing the potential of those community members? It's the team at AP. Apex Automation. Right now, they're putting out a call to professional engineers in Canada. They're hiring right now for projects in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan. They've got a huge thing going on with potash mining in Saskatchewan right now. Very cool. Plus, opening field offices further east and down south in Texas. If you're in a position right now where you feel like you're giving your company more than your company's giving back, you feel like you've got more potential to reach, check out the careers link today at Apex Automation. .ca. Mm -hmm. I know you want to get back to your guest, but we were talking about it yesterday and now it's out. So you probably can't. It's pretty, we were talking about Gondek. It's pretty crazy. That guy with the recall got a meeting with her today. Hey, so, so <laughs> have they announced, they've announced it while we're talking. It's, I see it up. They revised a previous uh, article from two weeks ago. I threw it in your Slack, but yeah, okay. it's out there that he's meeting with her today. Yeah, so, so, so the background of this, so, so, so uh, thanks for bringing that up. So, so the fella that organized this recall Gondek campaign, uh, it th worked. Th they're kind of presenting him as just like, he's just a guy. David he's, and Goliath. He's just a guy, and he's organizing this petition to have the mayor of Calgary recalled. He's not going to do it successfully, but if you want to know what's really going on here, make sure you watch our Political Conspiracy Exposed episode from earlier this week with Dr. Dwayne Bratt. You'll see why they're collecting all those names and all those signatures. We can let you know Mayor Gondek sitting down with him one-on-one, -on -one, the organizer of the petition, today. It's Friday afternoon, so... First thing Monday, out of the gates, live at 8.30 Mountain Time or later on demand, we'll be speaking exclusively with Calgary's Mayor Gondek. We'll basically get a sense of how that meeting went and what the implications are. That's coming up on Monday's Real Talk, and then Adler will come in and hit clean up, and I'm looking forward to his assessment of that. We're hanging out with, with Taskwinds Mayor Tyler Gannon, who's the president of Alberta Municipalities, and his uh, colleague, of course, Tanya Thorne, is the director for Town South with Alberta Municipalities and the mayor of Okotoks. Uh, mayor Thorne, how are you feeling? Like, you personally, obviously, uh, a huge part of your career, a huge part of your public service is, is municipal politics. How do you feel about the the potential, the possibility of political partisan influence infusing itself into town halls, city halls. I don't think that it'll make municipal politics better. Mm. Um, I don't think it's going to give um, citizens better government. Uh, you know, I, I, I love municipal politics because it's nonpartisan. Um, so for me, I sometimes struggle as to which party I, I feel like I lean to because there's elements of policy across all party platforms that I think are good. Um, and I say it a lot that no political party gets it 100% right and no one gets it 100% wrong. And so what I love about municipal politics is we get to take the pieces of, of this idea was good, this part was good, this was good, and create a new idea. And we don't get aligned or tied down by, yeah, but the party says we have to do this idea. And, and I think that that flexibility in municipal politics will be um, happened. Uh, the other part of it for me, last time I checked, delivering water and wastewater, I don't know how that's a political issue. That is 
people want clean water and they they want the water to go away when it's done. Um, you know, so how how is what stripe you are? How does that make those decisions better? We we do roads, water, infrastructure, recreation. Um, my political strike doesn't impact how those decisions are made, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, the premier, uh, unfortunately, was after our interview with her uh, a short time ago, but she went on the record and, and said that, uh, I mean, she supports this. Uh, premier says she's in favor of municipal political parties, uh, particularly for large cities, um, citing the single-use paper and plastic mm-hmm. bans in Edmonton as evidence of the partisanship of local government which just makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't understand what a, a plastic ban has to do with evidence of partisanship of, of local government. But there is, a, 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 I think, a, 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 a place for a bigger conversation around whether or not you know, the public should see its elected representatives disclose partisanship affiliation. I, I just don't know that making it official is the right move. Minister McIver says since it's happening, it's good to have some rules around it, which is kind of an interesting tone to take on it. Uh, Mayor Gandam, where are you landing right now? Has, has your opinion changed since you and I last spoke about this pretty candidly? Not at all. Like mm. Mayor Thorne said, there's absolutely no benefit to local government on whether or not I wear orange pajamas or blue pajamas. It makes zero sense. And so last week while I was at Alberta Municipalities MLC, I was having a conversation with a Calgary councillor and we were talking about um, the homeless problem and social needs and it was a, a relatively good conversation. And so I talked to him for about 15, 20 minutes and was getting to a point where we were going to end the conversation. And then he asked where I stood on safe consumption sites and I said, I don't want to get into this. And he lashes back and says, see, all you lefties are the same. So this was after me telling him that I lean right of center in terms of my political ideological sense of where I belong on the spectrum. And he snaps back with that. And so the the hard thing for me is that I'm I'm the mayor of the city of Wetaskiwin. The community comes first. What's in the best interest of my community? Right now, we've got a ton of social issues. So because I'm looking after social issues in my community, that makes me left-leaning. I don't see how that matters. If you're looking after the best interests of your community, it matters what what is the issue of the day or what the issue is of that term. And that's what I've been working on right now. I had the opportunity to to say the same thing to Premier Smith while we were talking about political parties at the municipal level. She did a Q&A during our Municipal Leaders Caucus, and I said the same thing. I lean right of centre. But because I'm dealing with social issues in my community, that makes me a, a lefty or or I all of a sudden I get painted with this brush. The divisiveness that's going to come of people identifying in terms of what political party they align with while they're trying to decide where they're going to put a park or which roads need to be overlaid or how much money they're going to put into infrastructure makes zero sense. And it's, it's not going to make governing better in a community. And I don't understand why identifying yourself on a ballot is going to change the dynamics of that community in any way. We've got over 300 communities across or municipalities across Alberta, and everybody's got their own issues that they're dealing with. And so why does it matter that you align with the political party of the day, whether it's the UCP, the progressive conservatives, or the liberals, or the NDP, whatever it happens to be, show me where that's going to make governing in my community better, and I'll absolutely get on board with that. But I have no problem saying where I align politically on the spectrum. Yeah. We have somebody who sees the the work that I'm doing in my community will automatically assume that I'm left of center because I'm looking after the social needs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like I could go off on this. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm so frustrated to, to be honest with you. Um, I'm trying to think of like a metaphor, but, but I guess just like visually speaking, I would imagine all of us just imagine us standing on a flat plane, like a beautiful prairie plane. And that's the political spectrum. And you'll find that like people milling about, I'm envisioning like a church picnic or a music festival or something where the majority of people that are all gathered together and hanging out, that's where they are in the political spectrum. Like there's like the way, 
way over there on the left, you know, where they have the plastic bands. And then there's those way over there on the right where there's no masks or vaccines. But the majority of people are all hanging out and milling around in the middle. And some of them are like a little bit more toward the lefties party and some of them are a little bit more to the right. But now we, we, we're dumbing it down collectively so stupidly. Uh, if you envision like the sharpest triangle of all time, it's like you can't stand on the tip or the peak of it. So you got to you, you are either a lefty or a right winger. And what a dumb way to try to characterize people's politics. What a stupid way to try to understand people. It makes no sense. It's reductive and it's ridiculous. I mean, Tanya, do you agree? I, I, I Yes. Everything you just said, um, you know, like I, I the Municipal Government Act, which oversees us, everything we do, it, it, it says in there that I have to show up at the table with an open mind and be willing to have my mind change and, and vote as an independent. How if we align with traditional how we see parties work, what, is, is somebody going to be whipping a vote? Um, you know, that all of a sudden, because I've said I'm party X, Y, Z, that's the way I've got to vote. But I think the other lens that we're talking about, and, and Minister MacGyver made reference to this at our um, caucus last week, is that they're talking about putting political parties in, but they're saying that those political parties can't identify whether they're a UCP, an NDP, or a liberal. Right. And that it'll be unique for each community. So my community is going to have a party, and it's Okotoks ABC party. How is that going to help anybody knowing where I lean? Yeah. No, they're all oh, going to be called like the, know. yeah, it'll be like the Freedom Party or the Prosperity Party. They're going to have all these weird names, but you'll, I think you'll be able to figure it out pretty quick okay. based on who's running for what and what the platform looks like. I agree. But does that not complicate a political spectrum that's already complicated? Um, you know, and so I just do not see how it will. I, I went back and I looked at the decisions that my current council has made in the last two years. And I cannot come up with one decision that if I had an entirely UCP council, an entirely NDP or an entirely liberal, that probably would have been a different decision because we made decisions that are the best things for our community. And, and I just don't see how those would change when somebody has the complete facts that are there. And it comes back to the thing I think Alberta municipalities has been saying about a lot of stuff. What problem are we trying to solve? And is it because you have some municipal governments that challenge the current provincial government um, in their way of thinking and are willing to speak out and, and, and voice that? I legitimately don't know what problem it is we're trying to fix. Well, you, you I yeah, no, you know, it's worked great. You and I both know what the problem is. And the yeah. problem is, is that the, the, the municipal governments in Calgary and Edmonton are not conservative. That's the problem that the province is trying to fix. Do we all agree? I mean, I don't know if I want to put words in your mouth. That, that appears to me to be the problem. Well, they certainly are targeting the big cities. Um, absolutely. Um, that that is certainly where they're targeting. But the big cities have been vocal about concerns they've got in their in their big cities. So did they think a new government that's going to come in there if it's a conservative leading is is now not going to be vocal against them? Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't know. I'm not sure I do either. Uh, shout out to Garth in our live chat. Garth uh, tossing us 10 bucks in the YouTube super chat. We sure appreciate that. He says municipal politics is way too close uh, to the general population uh, for partisanship, even though he says talking to counselors, uh, you can feel, you know, if they're if they if they do have a political alignment, Garth says they should say. You know, they should disclose. I mean, I guess uh, I kind of think part of the beauty of it is 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 that you don't because you don't have to be reductive. I mean, I, I, I hate it even, you know, we talk about this on the show. Tyler, you and I have joked about this as well. People come up to me in the public all the time and they're, they, they like lean in like they're the first ones to ever ask me. And they're like, honestly, like for real, like for real. Where are you on the political spectrum? Like for real. And I'm like, dude, I've, I've, I've had my cards on the table forever. I've said it. I've said it since the outset of this show. I've said it since before. Or I said I consider myself to be a small P, small C progressive conservative. In other words, there's currently no option for me. So my cards are on the table. But how does that influence, you know, were I to be a city councilor? Were I to serve the public like the two of you do as a mayor? Uh, influence how I feel about things like 
ending homelessness or addressing the opioid crisis or how we feel about trying to keep, uh, you know, property taxes, uh, you know, within, you know, the, the rise of inflation or, or, or how we feel about where we should prioritize the next big infrastructure spend, whatever the case may be. Is it going to be based on like conservative this, liberal that? No, there's nuance. There's understanding your communities. There's real life. How do people talk to each other in real life? And that to me is like the real beauty of municipal politics that you don't get at the other two levels. And that's what I think would be really regrettable if you were to lose it. Well, and I think the other piece that I would add there, I agree with you, is that instead of voting for people, which I think at municipal level, we vote for people because you get to a feel for people, we're going to vote for labels. And I, I'm not sure a label makes better government. Yeah, I mean, interesting point from Tracy, who says, uh, you know, in- introducing partisanship says, I suspect that that may discourage some people from running. Uh, from seeking office, it says, but maybe that's the point for the conservatives, some sort of fear mongering. I mean, it may draw other people in. I mean, it could have an interesting impact either way. We'll only know uh, as time tells. Um, I, I want to get back to the two of you. If you can stick around for five more minutes, I, I do want to ask you, there was a, a pretty remarkable delivery, uh, a statement uh, by housing critic, opposition critic uh, Janice Irwin in the Alberta legislature uh, this week uh, about ending homelessness and the affordability crisis in Alberta. That's obviously, uh, you know, Mayor gandam has been on this show many times uh, talking about what they've been trying to do in Wetaskiwin and 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 the initiatives across the province. Um, I want to make sure that that clip makes it into this episode because it is powerful and I want to get those two to respond. Uh, that's coming up in two minutes or less. But first, let me remind you that this show doesn't happen. These conversations do not happen without the support of Real Talk partners like our friends at Eden Landscaping. This is the time of year where they're getting ready to dust off their boots and shovels. Their team is getting ready to go to work the minute the ground thaws. They're going to be bringing outdoor spaces to life in the central and northern Alberta regions, which means if you're hoping to get your landscaping project done this summer, you got to get in touch with them today at landscapeedmonton.ca. They can take you through their portfolio, show you some of the work they've done, or vice versa. You can show them your Pinterest board. You can show them the pages you've been ripping out of landscaping magazines. Work with Eden Landscaping because they understand the philosophy of an exceptional landscape has got to be a thoughtful, flowing vision. It's got to stand up over time. It's got to function as the landscape matures. They're thinking about your project today and 20 years from now. And they're great listeners. That's Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. If you're an electrician, if you're an apprentice soon to enter the job market, if you're a human resources uh, expert, if you have work in sales, experience there, or even in office management, Kubi Energy wants to hear from you. This is Canada's fastest growing green energy company installing solar energy solutions across Alberta, BC, and Saskatchewan. Kubi's opening new offices and they're staffing up, which means there's huge opportunities for you. You can check out the careers link at kubienergy.ca to learn more about what life looks like when you join Team Kubi. Don't forget Kubi Energy uh, pre- uh, right here on this show uh, presenting Positive Reflections, the first episode of every week. If you had something happen, a random act of kindness, somebody paid it forward, something made you laugh or smile, hey, hey we want to see it. We want to hear about it. Send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Put Positive Reflections in the subject line that's presented proudly by Kubi Renewable Energy. And our friends at Complete Care Restoration, hey, prompted by that conversation yesterday our world water day episode that's march 21st you can check it out a lot of talk about drought a lot of talk about flood a lot of talk about wildfire felt like a bit of a gut punch but it's good to have those reality checks right complete care restoration is at the ready to respond should disaster strike in your community for more than 25 years they've been restoring properties and rebuilding peace of mind listen they hope you never have to call them but if you find yourself in a tough spot fire flood asbestos mold or otherwise remember complete care restoration thanks to kenny for the ten dollar super chat wow shout out to kenny 
20 bucks. What are we going to do with this newfound wealth? <laughs> I'm going to have to go grab a bite to eat the two of us. Hey, in all seriousness, that means so much to us when you show us your support, Real Talkers, and we appreciate that. Our Patreon supporters, those of you uh, kicking in uh, yep. in the live chat, the YouTube super chat as well. Uh, we're going to put this in front of Mayors Tanya Thorne and Tyler Gandam in just a second. I'm not sure if the two of you saw this, but but here is opposition housing critic. Uh, she's an MLA out of Edmonton, uh, Highlands Norwood. Uh, this is Janice Irwin in the Alberta Legislature. That is what we heard the minister call the belongings of our unhoused neighbours this morning. I cannot believe the lack of compassion for unhoused Albertans. It's disturbing that a member of this legislature would make such an incredibly disrespectful comment violating the dignity of the people that we serve. It is not an MLA's job to decide if the items that someone has are garbage or not. And I will remind this minister, homelessness is a policy failure, and it is under this UCP government that homelessness has doubled. After mass encampment sweeps this winter, the UCP UCP set up a navigation centre for unhoused Edmontonians. The Minister has misled Albertans into believing this centre is connecting hundreds with housing. This morning, I asked the Minister directly just how many of the 630 unhoused Albertans sent to the navigation centre have been provided permanent housing. His answer? Five. That means not even 1% of the people who have used this service have been permanently housed. Let me say that again, not even 1%. The minister cannot force Albertans off the streets, out of sight, further into the margins, and then pretend as if he has fixed this problem. We need unhoused Albertans connected with permanent supportive housing. Not a referral to a wait list, not a mat on a concrete floor, not a bed in a night-only shelter. Remaining trapped in the shelter system is not the same as being housed. This minister cannot continue to deceive Albertans. The UCP are not housing unhoused folks. They are not addressing skyrocketing rents. They are not making home ownership more affordable. Affordable. They are not building housing to keep up with population growth. They refuse to acknowledge the hundreds of thousands of Albertans who are at risk of homelessness. The only thing the UCP want to do is fearmonger about Bill 205 and rent caps rather than face the facts. A temporary rent cap would help countless Albertans and keep them in their homes. I'm tired of the lack of accountability. I'm tired of the heckling. Albertans are tired. We are in a crisis. We, the NDP, are treating it like one. Why aren't the UCP? So there you have it. Uh, you're not going to find a more passionate public servant than Janice Irwin just absolutely spitting fire on the floor of the Alberta legislature. I want to keep the, the question general to both of you. Uh, Tyler, I know that this has been an issue in Wetaskiwin. This is obviously an issue across the province and across the country. How does that message land with you? Homelessness and the social needs are a, a provincial mandate. Imagine if I wasn't having to put a lot of as much energy as I have or my council as they have or my administration that they have over the last five years, if we were having this addressed by the order of government that it falls on. And maybe I wouldn't be recalled right now. Who knows? Um, so a, a great speech, I think. I think it... Uh, it begs the question on what we're going to be doing next with homelessness on the rise the way that it is doubling since covid what changes are we going to make to that and i i i don't know what the answer is i mean there are far smarter people than me that have been working on this way longer than i have it is absolutely a huge problem but a problem that we have to deal with and the the strain that it puts on a community is i can't even tell you how much money and not that it comes down to money but how much money a, a municipality puts into homelessness with the police, EMS, hospitals, um, and just the strain that it has on our businesses. And if I switch hats and go back to the fact that I'm a licensed funeral director and bomber and just retired as a fire captain, how that impact has on a community when you're um, being quite like picking people up who have died in a field of either an overdose or to the elements, or how many times I've administered naloxone or done CPR on somebody who's in the middle of a drug poisoning. The the strain that it has on a community is is overwhelming. And if there aren't going to be changes made, and I mean like significant changes made to what and how we're handling the social issues that we've got across the country and, and in Alberta, then nothing's going to get better and it's going to get far worse. And the last four years have shown me that it's going to continue to get far worse dude um i'm not doing my job right now i complete it completely slipped my mind that you are being recalled as well 
why the hell did I not bring that up when I was talking about Mayor Gondek? Thank you for triggering my memory and reminding us of that. I don't want to take away from the seriousness around the homelessness chat, and I do want to return to that with Mayor Thorne in just a second. But can you up? That was wasn't that back in February? Can you update us on where that story's at? I apologize, I didn't ask you about that. No, that's totally fine. We're uh, three weeks away from the end of my sixty days. Um, the the group that is has set up the recall on me right now started a petition pre Christmas on wanting to block the the homeless shelter being built in Wetaskiwin. And they got about a thousand signatures, not just from people in Wetaskiwin, but from everywhere. Um, And then it changed into, uh, they've lost trust in my ability to govern uh, because I stood by a decision made by council uh, to build a homeless shelter, which by the way is uh, funded $3.2 million by the provincial government our or the contract is had between hope mission and the the government is with the provincial government not the city of Tasquin. so the fact that and don't get me wrong i'm loving the fact that the province is stepping up and making sure that uh, addressing the homeless issue that we've had in Wetaskiwin for 50 years is is getting some some attention that's amazing but i'm getting recalled um, for standing by and supporting a homeless shelter that is well needed in our community. And again, to somebody who doesn't know me or wouldn't take the time to get to know me, I'm the leftist, the far far leftist that there is, and, and that's all there is to it. And so the thing that frustrates me the most is I can see all the comments or lots of the comments on social media, and by 99% of them, somebody who hasn't even had a conversation with me to talk to me about how I feel, what I think, or why I support what I do. But the the train of misinformation that continues to get spewed on social media is 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 laughable, I guess. Um, one of the comments made by somebody at an open mic at, at one of my council meetings as he was walking out said something to the effect of me continuing to have secret meetings with the NDP. And I I laughed. Like it was a it was a funny comment. But it's that perception of people who think that because I support something in my community, I stand for something or I align uh, politically with a party, which is a huge red flag for me on why you would want to bring political parties at the municipal level. Deal with the issues you have in your community and carry on. Make it the best community you possibly can. We're all competing with one another to attract uh, businesses and people and tourism and if you start throwing things like that in there and people are making decisions based on the political strike, we're, we're all going to lose and it's going to suck. And it's municipal politics is going to suck for the next 18 months before the next election, because it's going to get much worse in terms of the misinformation that's being spread to try to bolster and, and get into a position where you want to run for the next election. And you're going to drive away people who are fantastic mayors and councils, councillors, or you're going to drive away people who would make great mayors and councillors. And so for the next probably five and a half years, municipal politics is going to suck. And I'm really nervous about the damage it's going to do to the communities. And I'm really nervous about the damage it's going to do to our province. I appreciate your candor. Uh, You're probably not expecting this question, but like, do you ever, do you ever just, are you ever like, fuck it, I'm out? Like... Mm -hmm. 100%. At what point do I need to continue to take the abuse that I've been taking, death threats, threats against my family or the the abuse my family takes? I can like I can take the abuse, whatever. I'm I'm not supposed to fight back. I had posted a video. It's about seven and a half minutes long. And if you get a chance to find it, I love it. It I've been walking around with a thousand pounds on my shoulders because I've been taking all of this shit and abuse for for months years maybe uh, and i finally had enough and i posted a video setting some of the things straight and i walked out of the my office and told my wife when this backfires um remind me how good i felt after i did it and Hell yeah and it hasn't it hasn't backfired I, I mean i've been getting tons of support not only from people in my community but people outside of the province who have seen it and loved it other elected officials who wish that they could say and do something like that and I guess my message to them is is do it. it. Enough is enough. And the amount of abuse that we're taking, especially through social media, fake profiles, anonymous accounts, or anonymous posts, like, 
grow up, if if everybody here who is elected across the province can put their name to something like that and continue to stand up for their community, why can't you? Why can't you make a public post? Why can't you? Why do you have to hide behind a fake profile? Step up. And if you don't think I'm doing a good job, then put your name on the ballot. Very few of the people who have a problem with me or what I'm doing in my community put their name on the ballot to do a better job. And so I challenge people to do that. Sorry, I shouldn't get... <laughs> no, no, that's exactly what you should do. And you should not say sorry. And I absolutely love it. And my concern um, and, and Mayor Thorne, I, I want to sort of like give the conch over to you so you can pick up where, where Mayor Ganim's leaving up. But my concern is that people like the two of you um, are leaving politics or, you know, I'm not I'm not forecasting your moves, but I'm just saying, like you just said, Gandam, you know, we're chasing the good, decent empathetic, smart, experienced, committed people out of politics, and we're opening the door for mouth breathers and idiots. Like, what's your alternative to not building the homeless shelter? Like, what's the alternative? To just not solve it? Like, what's the alternative? Why is it a leftist perspective to ensure that there is emergency or or, or longer-term shelter for people experiencing homelessness? Do these people even fucking listen to themselves but i don't think they do mayor thorne yeah that was exactly what i was gonna say is well not quite exactly F bomb but, and everything yeah well potentially but um is when did homelessness and having housing for people become a left or a right issue it's not like and and that's that's the challenge that i have and so you know janice's speech i she's passionate um, but she's she I feel she's throwing solutions at the wall. Um, and, and I think that that I t- spoke about it earlier. Homelessness is one of those challenges we're all facing at every level of government across the country. That is complicated. It, there is not a just this will be the fix and it will work in every single community. The homeless homelessness issues that Tyler is dealing with are very different than what's in my community. So his solutions won't work in my community, but we don't, we want to have this, this is a solution for everybody conversation. And, and I think that there is also a perception of what a homeless person means, you know, and, and I've heard that language of, oh, well, they've got drug problems, you know, they're, they don't work. They're, they're not contributing to society. I I'm aware of a lot of working homeless. We've got a lot of our society that is on the verge of homelessness and they're fully employed. So where are those contingencies and how are we supporting those people? Um, and, and, and it's not even those people. How are we supporting people? These are neighbors in some cases. Um, you know, I hear stories in my own community of people that are they're on the brink and they don't know what they're going to do. And so, you know, where are we? with policy around housing first. You've seen it across the world. You know, Finland's a great example. They've got a housing first problem or policy and they have the lowest homelessness um, in the world. So they're doing something right in my opinion. What does that look like? And is there elements we can learn from it? And saying that, you know, you've gotten rid of all of these encampments. It was one of the things when the minister was speaking last week that we was talking about that I kept asking of, Okay, so if you had a place to put them all and you've put them all on buses and given them a meal, why didn't they have those places before the encampment started? And do they still have those places today? Or are we just delaying the next encampment to show up? And and I don't think we've seen that information yet Um, and and, and where that has happened. Because if, if the place existed originally, there's a big chunk of people that they don't want to be on the street. Um, But I also think we need to acknowledge there are some people that that is where they want to be. And and so how do we make sure that they're not um, creating havoc for the rest of society and they have the ability to live their life in that way? And and I can't comment to how we get to that state, but I I don't know. I'm, I'm just tired of it's a left or it's a right. We actually need to talk about solutions because there's people dying on the streets and that breaks my heart. 
That's so very well said, Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, I, I just want to let, I mean, let our audience know we've kept you both way beyond what we asked for. And, and I, it feels to me, Mayor Thorne, like I, I've been watching your eyes move around and it feels like you've been having to shuffle meetings and, and things. I think we might have been making your last half hour a little bit difficult. So I want, to apo- I want to apologize for that. And thank you both for your availability. But more so than that, this is a first. Um, I want to let the two of you know that Chad is watching right now live on YouTube and he has kicked in 10 bucks to the super chat for the first time i believe johnny specifically directed toward our guests he has said uh, says chad uh, with his 10 dollar contribution to our youtube super chat we all need to treat our politicians better especially if we want good people in politics he said this 10 bucks is so ryan can buy these two a bevy so let uh, let me tell you uh, you've both got one in the kitty uh, as a matter of fact johnny will set them aside in the real talk beer. Are, are, tanya are you a, are you a, are you a wine drinker beer drinker or what's your are you a bourbon drinker not bourbon not but bur- i can do a good wine or a good beer okay and you tyler we'll have an old-fashioned again my friend oh buddy Ooh. the 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 bourbon is ready for you and, jam. and mayor thorne we are going to have a beautiful bottle of wine with your name on it uh courtesy of chad uh the real talker here as uh, in all seriousness uh for appreciation for what the two of you are doing uh your work with alberta municipalities uh, uh by the way people can check out uh, the website abmunis.ca uh if you want to learn more about what alberta municipalities is doing strength in members supporting alberta's municipalities uh, whether you're an elected official, uh, an engaged citizen, or otherwise, there's a wealth of information there and a ton of resources. Uh, thanks to the both of you for joining us here today. I didn't want to let something escape without a mention, and, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but my understanding is at your convention, uh, you had an education session talking about municipal political parties. It was held on Vimeo. It was, it was a video session, and I, I don't know who named it, uh, but talking about political parties at municipal level, uh, the session titled fight for your right not to party defending the local in local elections whoever named that deserves a race i just wanted that on the record very well done our staff our staff at alberta municipalities are amazing (laughs) yeah yeah i'll say uh so great work to the both of you we appreciate your candor we appreciate you keeping it real and i look forward to our next conversation thanks tyler Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, you bet, Mayor. Thanks very much. Uh, that's Mayor Gandum, of course, uh, Tyler Gandum, uh, out of Itasca, and he's the president of Alberta Municipalities, uh, and Tanya Thorne, the mayor of Okotoks, the director for Town South. Um, yeah, that recall. I'm so glad he, Great he reminded us that he was being I know, recalled. I, know. I felt like I, I kind of brought it back with Gondek, and then... Uh, and then as I was saying it, I'm like, wait a minute. I can't believe I forgot. And he's not the only one either. Like, there, there, there's several. They're, they're yeah. happening in smaller communities. It's it's way more doable in smaller communities, yeah. right? you got to get go get that 40%, that magic number. It's way easier than in Calgary, where they got to go get 550,000 mm-hmm. signatures, which and, isn't happening. But this isn't like you expect, like, wh- hey, why is – I'm not talking about Gandam. Why is the mayor being recalled? Uh, he's corrupt. Hypothetically, he's oh, because they, they busted yeah, yeah. him with two prostitutes yeah, and, a, and a bag of Coke. No. Like, no. It's, it's like because he wants to help house the homeless it's changed so much good from call like, with tasco in <laughs> 20 30 years ago i was just thinking that like I, I love the freedom that we have to be able to you know question our elected officials and to 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 make recall petitions but yeah. now it's just like because you don't agree with them it's so stupid that's what elections are for but i mean go ahead exercise your right to recall go ahead and do it but like if you can that's do it, with, it if you can do it with a straight face because like your your mayor's a lefty because he's trying to find shelter for mm-hmm. the homeless through alberta winters like give your head a shake well, right even, even the gondek list of stuff we were talking about this the other day i was like she doesn't control that <laughs> that's out of her spec like yeah. the things you're talking about is just yeah. maybe opinions she may have that you don't disagree that you disagree with and I which, get that- which is not a reason to recall someone it should be on their record it should be on their integrity and like you said you know whether they're doing horrible things whether they're corrupt and yeah. that's not the case in these situations uh ken in the chat wanted to give him a shout out as well i know what we did earlier for his ten dollar super chat uh, contribution but ken did say that he's starting what did he say he's starting the real talk party he said <laughs> he and said, i think he yeah. said he said i'm starting the real talk party and this is my initial investment yeah um i like that uh There's... ken and we're down on that but but ken did have a follow-up comment which i appreciated where he basically said that that uh, uh nobody works harder for less and takes as much shit as municipal 
municipal councilors and mayors. Uh, thank you for your tremendous service. And I echo what Ken says. These guys are not getting like if you I mean, they're different for every municipality. Sometimes we've asked them uh, what they make. <laughs> it's a little tacky. But but the point is, um, you ask like town councilors across Canada uh, what they make mm -hmm. or like small towns, small city, medium sized city mayors. The salaries are a joke. And like I would and I, I have no problem. Here's real talk. I would never do it. I would never subject myself to the bullshit that they deal with mm -hmm. for the money they make. They're not doing it for the money. That is so obvious and so apparent. Like, in my mind, we just talked to these two for, what, like an hour and 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. The last 15 minutes are the best. The sure. last 15 minutes where all of a sudden, I'm not – they kept their professionalism in place, but they told us what they really thought. And those two gave us the real talk that we were looking for at, at the end of that interview. And you try to tell me. You look me in the face and tell me that we need less of those. We need fewer of those people in politics. Hard disagree from me. Same. Same. Yeah. Unbelievable stuff. <laughs> Shout out to uh, Merck Bar, who says uh, Jordan Peterson has solved the Canadian – housing oh, problem oh, and good. we should watch his 1.5 hour interview on it okay good well hey jordan we're in good why don't you just jordan give us peterson. the gist of it because one point hours five no. hours of logaria i mean with peterson he probably like two sentences Did you, you see the, break uh, it down into you saw the guy uh this is dan dillabaugh is his name i'd never yeah. heard of him before but he's a, i guess he's a new addition to this hour or to 22 minutes i guess they're calling mm -hmm. it now um and so dan dillabaugh went and like and checked in uh with pierre poliev i don't know if you guys saw this but but he, he, he basically um, shows up to a conservative event, like a conservative fundraiser, and, uh, and, he, and he goes and stands in line to get a photo with Peter Polyev. And um, it's, like, honestly, one of the funniest things I've seen in a long time. He, he, he shows up, and he's, he's, he, he received, like, a robocall inviting him to this conservative fundraiser, so he goes, <laughs> and, and he's there. And I, I tweeted it yesterday, so you can find it if you follow me on Twitter at Ryan Jesperson. You'll see it there. But it's just so funny and his one liner so he walks up and, and he's in line and he's getting his photo with Pierre Polyev it, it's like total it's a, it's ambush comedy right and so he walks up and he says you know Pierre Polyev or Mr. Polyev he says uh, I'm Dan Dillabaugh with 22 minutes and Polyev just I mean you, I don't want to ruin it you, you just have to watch it it's about two minutes but but Polyev is like knocked back on his heels really realizes that all of a sudden he's part of a bit right and he and he starts going ah, bah, 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 and he kind of is like bah, 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 well pretty soon you'll be losing your job when we defund the cbc and 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 dan dillabaugh like just handles it it's absolutely hilarious does not he, he he abides by what my grandpa rudy taught me uh, strategically which is never let go of the handshake first yeah and so not none always of these, keep it there always keep so he's holding him there and there's this amazing exchange back and forth and anyway at the at the very end dan's got these like hilarious one-liners this is not like an attack everybody chill the fuck out it's not an attack on pierre poliev it's comedy you got to be yeah. how is how is it can a politician be a good sport can a politician be self-deprecating can a politician play along with sure. a bit and Polyev couldn't. So Dan, at the end of it, he looks and he and he looks into the camera and he says, Canada is broken and Pierre Polyev's going to finish the job. <laughs> I was just like, and that I mean, is so amazing. There's much worse going on with politicians out in the public right now. I thought that was pretty good. But, you know, you know, they're they're held to that account in public. Those robocalls in Ontario are crazy. I was just back there visiting my grandma. I told you that. And and she was saying to me how the, the Polyev calls she gets them every day she oh, started just saying more and more and she more. started just yelling at them i'm like grandma don't even answer the phone don't answer and yell at them but. so um we're talking about the anonymous haters and commenters that mayor gandam was talking about so i post that dan dillabaugh video um i just say this is one of the funniest things i've seen in a long time because it is funny if, if, if you're liberal if you're conservative you, you should be able to laugh at it it's fucking hilarious and thank you to ss71 with the wayne gretzky profile photo that just lets me know Normal Albertans hate you. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. And what is a normal Albertan anyway? I read that when I was at the Oilers game, John, uh, but I had had two strongbows already, so you'd be proud of me. <laughs> I stuck to my policy of no replying on Twitter after two strongbows. Never reply on Twitter after two strongbows. Our friends at Ladywood Boutique, we're so excited for them, and we want to give them a quick shout-out, uh, a big congratulations on the launch of their women's apparel brand. You can check it out online at ladywoodboutique.myshopify.com. Ladywood is unapologetically about celebrating your passions and exploring the things that ignite 
your soul. And that is why Lady Wood wants to send you and your ladies to the Real Talk Golf Classic coming up on Thursday, June 20th. This is simple. All you got to do is send an email to golf at ryanjesperson.com and make sure you put Ladywood in the subject line. That's it. The contest is open till March 31st, till the end of this month. At the end of that month, our friends at Ladywood are going to draw a winner selected at random. That winner is going to win a foursome in our golf classic in support of the Julie Rohr Scholarship. Uh, that's four spots, a $1,200 value, all courtesy of our friends at Ladywood. Make sure you enter the contest today. Send an email to golf at ryanjesperson.com with Ladywood in the subject line. Every week, our friends at the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, they set the table for us to blow off a little steam. This is a weekly tradition. You know it. A chance for you to bring us your hot takes, to bring the heat. We want to hear it. These are real emails sent to talk at ryanjesperson.com. It's the flamethrower presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. I love this one from Graham. Not really a flamethrower, but I wanted to open with it. Graham says, Jespo, Johnny, you guys seem to be catching a lot of shit these days from all sides. That means you're doing it right. You're never going to please everybody. Says, I've read comments, Jespo, that you're a Trudeau puppet, that you're a UCP shill, that you're an NDP agenda pusher. It's both hilarious and and sad how people get so worked up over this. Uh, Graham says, I don't follow politics too closely and I rely on Real Talk to hear all sides, which I appreciate. Keep it up, Graham. We promise we will. How about this one from Reese who says, Howdy, I'm shocked, shocked to discover that the people signing a recall petition for our careless, reckless, purely ideological progressive leader Jody Gondek might also have very similar political leanings as a whole. This is some serious 99-level big brain stuff right there from Dr. Dwayne Bratt. Literally, nobody could have seen this coming. Nice sleuthing, Dwayne. Uh, Reese says, I'm laughing my ass off. But seriously, Jespo, I do honestly hate you, but I respect the hell out of what you're doing here. Although you're still a crazy progressive, in my opinion. Opinion. At least you try to be somewhat fair. We need more speech, more debate, not less. And if that's what you're trying to bring to the table, then I'm all for it. Thanks. How about this one from Chris, who says, here's my take on Jespo's interview with Premier Danielle Smith and why she deserves very little trust. Ned Nenshi brought up the Tylenol debacle, the privatization of Dynalife Labs, ads for the Alberta pension plan, utility costs to the public, and doctors, ER, and ambulance availability. What did Danielle Smith respond with? Discussion with stakeholders, and no NDP leadership campaign will go on the record with their accomplishments, putting words in the mouths of candidates? Chris says, Nenshi's correct on this. She is immoral. What a sh- sham of a leader that from chris how about this one from sheldon who says this is a letter to ryan and charles adler i'm a longtime listener a regular enjoyer of your friday flamethrower thanks sheldon he says but i couldn't help but notice a bit of a spicy irony uh, during a recent discussion about the feedback you received on your trudeau interview that was february 21st says admittedly you two weathered some rather stinging critiques and i could almost hear the singeing in your voices as you aired them but the real irony came with charles Charles' remark about wanting to just hear the guy out. Just let him speak. These sentiments seem to echo a familiar interview philosophy. Let's rewind to your commentary on Tucker Carlson's interview with Vladimir Putin. The critique was fierce. Tucker was deemed unprofessional, not a real journalist, faulted for precisely not grilling Putin with the tough questions. Yet Carlson's approach largely mirrored your own philosophy of just letting him speak. Is there a bit of a double standard here? The expectation of relentless interrogation seems to be selectively applied. Fiery for some interviewees, mild for others. This dissonance is the kind of fuel that your far-right critics thrive on, Jesperson. Now, to be clear, I'm not defending any interviewee, Trudeau, Putin, or otherwise. I'm simply pointing out the amusing contrast in how you guys apply the standards of real journalism depending on who's in the hot seat. That from Sheldon, who figures Justin Trudeau 
and Vladimir Putin are pretty much the same guy. How about this one from Crystal who says Real Talk's amazing as a political junkie, as a social studies teacher, I listen to almost every episode. I love multiple perspectives. You guys picking up on a theme here? Uh, Crystal says regarding the Premier's out the kids policy, there's ways around it and you better believe I'm going to take them. Says if a kid comes to me, tells me they're wrestling with their identity, struggling with self-harm, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, you better believe that I'll contact their parents to find that child's support. But that contact does not necessitate revealing the child's emerging gender identity. If the child is using alternative pronouns but are otherwise well engaged socially, managing their anxiety, and just trying to figure out life, that policy can go fuck itself. Crystal says children are not undergoing medical procedures without parental involvement. Allowing them to play with pronouns does not mean they're always going to transition. Psychologists know when to give information to parents. And as teachers, as professionals in education, we've got similar expectations. Privacy is important. Security and safety is important. When those come into conflict, adults have to make thoughtful decisions and sacrifice privacy. But pronouns are not a safety issue, so good luck enforcing a stupid policy. And how about this one from Harvey, who says, guys, do you think you could maybe get like three federal MPs, one from each party on the show together, to explain why it's okay for them to have a pay increase every fucking year in April, and the rest of us take pay cuts and just try to get by? And by the way, how long do they have to be MPs before they qualify for that plum pension? I had to work 40 plus years before I was able to qualify. Work until I die. That from Harvey. Thanks to all you real talkers that fire up your flamethrowers each and every week. Presented by the DQs in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. All emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Coming up on Monday's episode, one-on-one with Calgary Mayor Jody Gondek, who spills the beans on that one-on-one meeting with the organizer of her recall petition. And then Charles Adler. Gil McGowan wants to be Alberta NDP leader. He's going to join us on Tuesday. And next Thursday, Max Fawcett's going to explain why he says inflation is the province's fault. Have a great weekend, everyone. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford, 